All right. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I hope uh, everyone can hear me. If not, uh, please put a message in the chat room. Uh, welcome to 2023 CICM uh, Annual Conference. I'm Hussein Kazemi, the director of the center. Hussein, we cannot see you. You cannot see me. Uh, we only see the screen. Well, I'm not sure. Doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not that good looking anyway, so. Uh, don't worry, we'll, we'll, we'll continue, that's okay. Uh, so CISDM uh, is a research center at Eisenberg School of Management on the campus of UMass Amherst. It was established more than 25 years ago by my colleague, Thomas Schneeweis, with support from two alums, Mike Phillip and Anshu Jain, who sadly passed away about a year ago. Uh, CISDM is home to Journal of Alternative Investments and CISDM Hedge Fund Database. And we have an outstanding group of speakers who are going to join us to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the revolution in the theory and practice of finance that started with the development of the Black Merton Schultz as an option pricing model. First, let me thank our speakers for accepting our invitation. Also, I'd like to thank Sanjay Nawalka and Mila Gedmanski Sherman, Associate Directors of the Center. You will be hearing from them later today. Uh, our first speaker is Emmanuel Derman. He is well known to both academics and practitioners for his many important contributions to finance. We are all familiar with Black Derman Toy and Derman and Connie models of interest rates and volatility. He is a professor of practice emeritus in the financial engineering program at Columbia University. Among his many awards and honors, he was named Sangard IAFF financial engineer in, 2000, in the year 2000. He has a PhD in theoretical physics from Columbia University and is the author of numerous articles in elementary particle physics, computer science, and of course, finance. Uh, please join me in welcoming Emmanuel. Emmanuel, all yours. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you very much. I'm really happy to be here. Um, it's. Uh, 50 years since Black Shoals and unfortunately almost 30 years since Fisher um, since Fisher passed on. Um, I'm really just going to talk about my talks called Reflections on Fisher and I'm really just going to talk about mostly some recollections of Fisher and his um, idiosyncratic but um, very effective methods of working. And then later, um, right at the end, if I have time perhaps for a little, I'm going to talk about the effect of Black Scholes Merton on the past and on the future practice of finance. So let me start with my, my background with Fisher. I first met him in 1986 when I was a new hire working in fixed income at Goldman Sachs. I had just arrived. I was actually 40 years old, which was kind of late in life for beginning to do something new. I was working with the bond options trading desk in the fixed income quantitative strategies group trying to produce a model for valuing options on bonds which at that time now they're kind of um passe but at that time they were the hot product because interest rates had fallen from their phenomenal 15 percent or something like that long bond peak in 1979 and as bond mutual funds tried to stretch for yield when interest rates dropped to 10, 9, 8%, they sold call options on bonds, on bonds that they owned to try to generate income um, on top of the income that they received from the bonds that they owned. Um, and yields continue to fall. So our trading desk sold these options to various individuals and in particular to mutual funds. And they hedged them um, with listed treasury bond futures and um, they needed a model. And that's eventually what led to BDT. Um, it was an interesting time, <coughs> excuse me. The prevailing models in use at that time, they seem very naive now, treated bonds like stocks are treated in a Black Shoals Merton world. But that didn't really work because stocks are perpetuities 
and the passage of time doesn't really affect their intrinsic qualities. A stock 10 years into the future, if you're modeling it, is still a stock with an infinite amount of time to go in, in theory. But bonds age, and as they age, they move down the yield curve so that a longer bond continuously is transforming into shorter and shorter bonds until finally the bond that you're writing the option on um, gets shorter and shorter or perhaps even expires. And so this slowly became clear to people doing the modeling, both in academic life. And I remember at Goldman, we had um, competition from Morgan Stanley and from all kinds of other places who were building similar models. Um, it became clear to modelers and to traders that you couldn't model one bond or even an option on one bond the way you did in Black Shoals, that you had to model all bonds. That is, you had to model the whole yield curve because one bond didn't remain one bond with the same maturity. Fisher and my friend Bill Toy in the equities division, I was in fixed income, were working on the same problem as me. And so in mid-1986, I was summoned to meet Fisher. Um, I went up and knocked on the door of his office, which was on the 29th floor, and I entered. And immediately it was clear that Fisher was different from everybody else at Goldman Sachs. His office was much less glamorous than um, those of other Goldman partners. He was sort of an anomaly at Goldman the whole time he was there. I'll talk a bit about that later. And I would guess he was an, he was an anomaly his entire life in all the circles in which he participated in. He sometimes bragged, I'm not sure that's the right word, but he sometimes bragged that he was proud to be the partner with the least number of shares at Goldman. And he thought that was right, that salespeople and traders who were really responsible for the revenue um, should, should have a bigger stake in the firm than him. Um, his office was dominated by a large Nike poster on the back wall that you saw as you walked in. It was a poster of a long, long road, no runner on it, disappearing into the distance. And below it, there was the sentence, the race is not always to the swift, but to those who keep on running. I think Fisher really taught, thought that way, and I'm going to talk about this later again, but when I ran into, I don't know if you know what it's, well, I guess you all know what it's like in organizations, when I ran into the usual turf squabbles at Goldman later in my career, he always encouraged me to think long term and to ignore the politics, and he did that to himself, sort of par excellence. Fisher had been brought to Goldman from MIT by Bob Rubin, then chair and um, then head of Goldman Sachs, but later um, Treasury Secretary under Clinton. Um, and he was one of the first finance academics to head to the street. Unlike many other academics who worked for a while on Wall Street, but still maintained their umbilical links to the safe haven of universities, hedging their bets by taking leaves of absence for a year or two and working as part-time consultants, Fisher sort of abandoned academia wholeheartedly. So I went into his office and after a brief introduction, I began to show him the bond option model that I'd only been at Goldman a couple of months that I had inherited and had cleaned up in fixed income. It had a lot of problems that didn't respect put call parity. Um, there were a bunch of problems with it. In addition, ah, I won't go into it. It was sort of an enhanced Black Shoals model for an option on an individual bond. It wasn't a yield curve model, but instead of treating the bond as a stock, it treated the bond yield to maturity as a stochastic variable, which and and it correlated the bond yield to maturity with the um, with the riskless discount rate that you use for valuing the option. So that as the bond yield to maturity did its Brownian evolution, um, the short term rate moved parallel to it. So it was a very crudely tried to represent the yield curve, but not really in a calibrated way. Those were days long ago where we used a VAX. I don't know if anybody still knows what a VAX is um, for time sharing. And I had built a graphical user interface for the options traders because I knew how to build graphical user interfaces having just come there from Bell Labs. And um, I logged Fisher into it on a VT100 terminal emulator. I barely remember the name on his PC, which was what he always used. And almost as soon as my program started running, the VAX crashed, and we were left looking at the frozen screen image of my calculator. <laughs>
um, you couldn't run anything or demonstrate any any um, any numbers. I offered to come back later, but Fisher was really quite unperturbed about the crash. He then spent the next hour examining on the and commenting on the user interface, which in those days was 24 lines on a screen, each line with 80 characters, controlled only by a keyboard, no mice. Mm -hmm. I was kind of surprised at his willingness to spend so much time looking at merely the interface without learning anything about the insides. But this was kind of typical of Fisher. I soon discovered that he was an incredible stickler for precision and for clear and clear expression was really a constant and invariant devotion of his. He hired people, I'll mention later, to actually work on making um, everything he wrote as clear as possible. And over the years, I became a convert um, actually very quickly to his, maybe not his writing style, but his intention and tried as hard as I could in anything I subsequently wrote in all the years I was at Goldman and after that to be as clear and didactic as possible. We were writing for people who weren't very numerate in those days and um, the aim was to try to get them to understand intuitively and viscerally what you were doing. When I talk about his attention to user interfaces and clarity, that's not to say he wasn't equally dedicated to usefulness and accuracy in modeling in a very pragmatic way about, again, which I'll say more about later, but that wasn't so surprising. It was his um, great regard for the user interface that at first shocked me. So in a few days, Fisher let me know that I could join his effort with Bill to create a new bond options model. And it was a singular opportunity for me having just arrived that had a large and very beneficial effect on my life and my attitude to things. So let me talk a bit about Fisher. Just as um, just as on the first day when I visited him, he was always very, very quiet and very calm, always in visible equilibrium, reading or on the telephone or entering his thoughts into Think Tank, which was a, a PC app for trying to keep track of all your thoughts, a, a note keeping program from the 1980s, which he really loved. He kept up a very fierce and furious correspondence with the writers of Think Tank, giving them suggestions for things to add or correct features. Um, he didn't really program Fisher. Think Tank and running models and emails were the main use of his were his main use of the computer. He didn't use pro he didn't write programs. He had people to write them for him, though he used programs he developed with others, and he had a lot of input into them, obviously. Fisher had strange taste in computers. He didn't like mice. He didn't like graphical user interfaces. He only liked pure text input. And he liked macros or keyboard shortcuts, which defined a single key to do several successive things, which he thought was much more useful than a mouse. I used to try sometimes, I was a big Apple fan, and I would try to um, convert him to, to uh, using graphical user interfaces, but he absolutely wasn't interested. But he paid great attention to everything that was said to him. If you or anybody else in his office said something he found useful, he typically would write it down in a very sharp pencil on a fresh sheet of his ruled white pad and then tear off the sheet and insert it into uh, one of a stack of fresh light brown manila folders, which he labeled in front of you and then insert it somewhere into one of his file drawers. He actually left behind 6,000 files like that. They're all archived at MIT by Beverly Bell, who I'm still in contact with, actually. She was the editor that he employed for all the papers and memos he wrote in those days. And she was the editor for the papers that I wrote with him, particularly BDT. Hmm. So let me talk a bit about BDT. I'm just checking my time, okay. Um, when we wrote the first draft of our paper on this one factor model of interest rates, that the trading desk was beginning to use, Fisher wanted absolutely no equations in it. Um, and I had a struggle long and very hard to satisfy his standards. He wanted accuracy and he wanted honesty, but without the technical details, which meant that you had to understand the model in a visceral sort of way and then explain that understanding. And I think actually what made um, BDT quite popular for a long time was 
the clarity of the mechanics of our model in writing it up that made it so popular and so widely used. We did more sophisticated things in the actual code, but um, we didn't explain them. The aim of the paper was to give short five, you know, five binomial tree long examples of how it worked. Um, we used the cox ross rubenstein binomial model as our modeling framework. Those were still naive days. Fisher liked binomial trees a lot, as did I, um, because traders could easily understand them. In those days, traders and salespeople did not know stochastic calculus, sometimes came from law school backgrounds, um, didn't have degrees in, um, in quantitative finance, and were relatively innumerate, a lot of them. And getting them to embrace a new model involved really getting them to understand how it worked and what its principle was, and then they would play with it and check the numbers against the previous model and against what they believed. This was especially true in equities as opposed to in fixed income. Um, a couple of years later, um, I once said to my friend, Mike Mendelson in equity derivatives, who's now I believe at AQR um, with Cliff Asness, I once said to him jokingly when I was already in equity derivatives later, I took over Fisher's group, that I thought fixed income people were smarter than equity people. To which he replied, that's because there's no competitive advantage to being smart in equities. Uh, that's not true anymore, but I think it kind of was true in the sense that equity people in the, <laughs> in the mid eighties were not as um, technologically and um, mathematically sophisticated as fixed income people. Anyhow, I think our model got widely based on trading flaws because it was easy to understand and explain and easy to read, and I've always tried to write that way since then. At the time, I also witnessed Fisher's pragmatic approach to the world, um, to the world of finance. I was tremendously excited by what we had done, and I, I was only six months out of more or less being still at heart a physicist, and I was still quite naive about financial modeling. And I have thought that what we had built was a grand unified theory of interest rates and imagine that we could use it to value every interest rate sensitive security in the whole world consistently. Fisher disliked this view of our model. He was more practical and much more experienced. He knew that there were financial um, qualities and forces that lay well outside our model. It seemed perfectly possible and obvious to him that the model might be good for one sector, simple options on treasury bonds, for example, but not for Options on the slope of the yield curve, obviously, in a one-factor model that wasn't good. Not for callable bonds or caps or a host of other options like fixed income instruments. He called what we had created an, an quote, as if model, by which he meant that we were assuming that the world of bond market investors behave as if, not in true life, but we were assuming they behave as if only short rates mattered to them. I came around to this view rapidly myself later and thought of, um, whenever I thought about models, I thought that what one's really building are um, very approximate simulations of the world um, with lots of simplifications and sort of let a thousand models bloom. Each one of them were, I thought of as Gedanken imaginary experiments in the style of physicists where each one might give you a different answer and you were never sure which one, um, there was no true model. Um, so let me talk about some of Fisher's attributes and qualities. As I mentioned already, clearly Fisher liked clarity. Um, but he could be kind of unyielding. If you didn't understand what he said, he was, he was sometimes a difficult guy, Fisher. If you didn't understand what he said, he didn't try harder to explain it to you. He simply repeated what he said before, as though he couldn't do any better than tell you the truth as he saw it and leaving you to come to recognize it. He didn't really try to persuade you. He expected clarity and directness from other people too. He was very generous with his time and didn't care about rank at all. He would pay equal attention to famous people in finance and to letters he got querying or arguing with him from people he didn't even know. He was open to listening to everybody equally on the basis of what they thought and what they said irrespective of who they were. You had to prepare for an audience with him. If it was evident that you hadn't thought carefully, 
about your question, you quickly discovered that he wasn't going to do your thinking for you. And he got bored. You had to speak his language to him. He thought about things a certain way. And it was most effective if you could tell him your own ideas in his style. Because he liked clarity, and perhaps because he hadn't been formally trained in economics, he really avoided excessive formalization. His papers were the antithesis of what I thought of as the unnecessarily rigorous, lemma-filled research papers of financial economics journals. He tried to write, he tried very hard, and he actually he liked several books whose names I don't recall about technical writing. He tried very hard to write in the same style as he spoke, in a sort of terse but good-natured conversational style, using clear but casual unadorned English. To me, there was always a touch of jerkiness to his prose because it lacked the technically superfluous conjunctions and, but, thus, therefore, that people commonly use to link the flow of sentences. And he somehow didn't use that a lot. He just wrote somewhat the way he himself spoke. Fisher was kind of uncomfortable with small talk, which always I found difficult. When he had nothing to say, he just said nothing. This could be kind of disconcerting on the telephone where after you had spoken for a while, he just simply kept silent for a minute or two without terminating the conversation. And this sometimes led you to babble in an attempt to fill the silence until finally he simply said abruptly goodbye and just hung up. <laughs> no, that's really true. I, I, I'm, I'm somebody who, um, anyway, yeah, I don't like these long, long silences. Um, this kind of directness and informality, informality characterized his research too. His approach, as far as I could tell, and I didn't know him early in his career, but always seemed to consist of ab initio, very unafraid, very hard thinking, intuition, and no great reliance on advanced mathematics. He attacked problems directly um, with whatever skills he had at his command, and often they worked. He gave you the sense, perhaps misguided, that you too could discover deep truths with whatever skills you had too, if you were willing to think hard. He was guided by his great economic intuition, um, though his mathematical skills were unexceptional, I would say. They weren't negligible, but he wasn't a great mathematician. His instinct was very strong, and he was incredibly tenacious in trying to attain insight before resorting to mathematics. Hmm. Bishop referred reality to elegance in modeling. In one of his last published papers entitled Equilibrium Exchanges, he succinctly stated his attitude at the end of his introduction. And I'm quoting. Um, in the end, he wrote, this entire article amounts to a series of conjectures about the nature of equilibrium, if one exists. I have been unable to provide an exhaustive and precise analysis of the implication of my assumptions, he wrote. But I would rather get, this is the part, I would rather guess about what follows from more relevant assumptions than derive precise conclusions from less relevant assumptions. <laughs> the, be the best thing he said is, quote, to explore a model. Being in the, maybe even before that, but being in the business world, Fisher had a really good grasp of the overwhelming importance of computing in making effective use of models which suited me because I'd spent five years at Bell Labs and I'd essentially spent a lot of time building user interfaces and for, for various models for people at AT&T. And in those days, I was relatively speaking a good programmer. He didn't believe in keeping models secret. He thought that the way they were used was critical um, and the environment they were embedded in was critical rather than just the bare bones of the model. People often asked why we made public our research on, B on BDT, given that we worked at a profit-making investment bank. The truth is, I think, and I agree, that models are really an unambiguous source of profits. What counts as much or more is the trading system, the discipline the trading system imposes, the operational errors it disallows, and the intuition traders gain from, gain from being able to experiment with the model. And there's also the, the reputation that a group or a, or a bank gains by getting the world to use your model 
and to use your insight and your implied parameters as a valuation and hedging tool. If you control the language people use, you control a lot of the sales. I particularly noticed this um, when I worked for a year at Salomon Brothers, the inventors of option adjusted spread, where having introduced option adjusted spread for corporate bonds and for mortgages, the whole world used that particular implied parameter to quote value and to rank to rank bonds of different value. And um, they sort of ruled the roost. And that was all the power of getting people to embrace your model, which had to be made public. So yeah, I, I, I think there's too much knee-jerk secrecy and I think Fisher did too. Mm -hmm. Fisher had his own way of thinking about markets. He was, as probably everybody knows, deeply inspired by the so-called general equilibrium approach to the capital asset pricing model. Um, the idea that prices and markets equilibrate when the expected return per unit risk is the same for all securities. This belief was the source of much of his intuition and actually was the method he first used to derive the Black-Scholes differential equation. He didn't derive it from hedging, he derived it from applying stochastic calculus to the fact that the excess return per unit of risk for the option had to be the same as the excess return per unit of risk for the, for the, um, for the stock. Um, he once wrote to me um, by email shortly before he died, I view all our, quote, I view all our work on fixed income models as resulting from the application of the capital asset pricing model to fixed income markets. Mm -hmm. I have a sort of mildly funny story, but I had a touching glimpse of his love for this approach a few years before he died when I was in charge of the quantitative strategies group, which he used to run. And I was interested in trying to figure out the effect of transaction costs on the value of the equity derivative options that our trading group was using and hedging. They had a lot of long-term options and exotic options. And they didn't trade, they had their own trading, they had their own hedging rules and they didn't hedge continuously. So we built a Monte Carlo simulation program that dynamically replicated um, each option as the stock price changed, but we added in the transaction costs um, numerically sort of along the lines of, um, of Hain Leland and other people. And, um, and then we intended to use the program to see how much uncertainty and how much margin of error this introduced over the life of the option if you hedged it according to whatever empirical rule the traders were using. Um, but you always have to check if you build a, a, a simulation model that it's actually working correctly. And the obvious check was to put the transaction cost to zero and hedge continuously, and then you should retrieve the Black-Scholes result. Um, so uh, that's what we did. And there was a guy in my group who wrote the first version of the model and um, ran it eventually with zero transaction costs and an infinite number of hedging transactions and didn't quite reproduce Black-Scholes. There was always a small error. The error should have gone to zero like the square root, one over the square root of the number of um, hedging transactions. But um, it didn't. It, something finite always remained, even with 10,000 rehedging. So I was kind of shocked. And I then wrote the program myself. And sure enough, I found the same thing. So I got very perturbed and um, went over to see Fisher, who at that time was um, in Goldman Sachs Asset Management. And, um, and I told him uh, that things didn't quite converge. And when I explained what I found, he very briefly became quite excited at the apparent inability of Merton's replication method to produce the exact black shells value and said something like, I'm more or less quoting now, you know, I always thought there was something a little wrong with the replication method. <laughs> um, it wasn't true, of course. What happened was my the guy in my group who wrote the program made one mistake and I wrote the program and made another mistake. I used N2, N N of D2 instead of N of D1 for the hedging by mistake. Anyway, um, I only tell you that because Fisher really was attracted to the cap M argument more than the replication argument, even though he wrote his paper listing both of them. And I can sort of see the attraction. I'm looking at my time. Um, I can see the attraction of the cap M argument. It's a little more general. It says that expected return per unit risk is the same for stock and for option but you don't have to say exactly what you mean by risk. If you define risk to be the volatility of a geometric Brownian motion, 
and you apply stochastic calculus, then you get the Black Scholes Merton result. But um, it sounds like a more general principle to say excess return per unit of risk should be the same for everybody. Um, even when risk is something more complicated, when there jumps, when there um, when volatility is rougher, etc. It's an equilibrium argument more than a dynamic edging argument. So I, I kind of like it myself. Fisher had some strange tastes. You couldn't easily guess his attitude to one question by knowing his opinion about another, though what he said was always thoughtful and sensible. Over subsequent years, I learned that he was kind of a rarity, one of those people you only occasionally meet someone whose character is sort of a coherent whole, even though all its parts seem to be uncorrelated. <laughs> at, at bottom, he simply really liked to think through everything for himself. And this didn't make him a great rebel, I think, but rather more of an outsider, nevertheless, whose work had a vast impact on the world of insiders. It was kind of impressive to watch. His independent thinking led him to unorthodox but well thought out ideas, many of which sound obvious later. He voiced some of them in speeches and in a collection of memos that he circulated informally at Goldman in the early 90s. How much longer do I still have? Somebody tell me. How much longer? Oh, oh, sorry, you got about uh, 10, 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. Oh, okay, that's fine. And if you want to take some questions, then maybe, you know, 9.45, we'll begin with Bob Jarrow, so it's 9.30. Okay. So five to 10 minutes questions, then five to 10 minutes more. Okay, I don't think I have more than 10 minutes. Um, one note he wrote about the foundation, striking at the foundation of, econ of financial economics, he wrote that um, certain economic quantities are so hard to estimate that I call them unobservables, he wrote. One of unobservable, he pointed out, is expected return. The amount by which, anyway, you know, all know what expected return is. And so much of finance relies on this. And yet, wrote Fisher, our estimates of expected return are so poor, they're almost laughable. In another essay called Managing Traders, he wrote that traders should be judged on the rationale behind their methods and paid if it is sound, irrespective of, irrespective of whether or not they made money recently. Mm -hmm. It's crucial to judge the stories they trade on, he wrote. Stories can be wrong, but I'm uncomfortable trading without one. Looking only or primarily at their profit or loss is a recipe for disaster. Um, 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 in his speech on being named financial engineer of the year, he said he always preferred applied to academic research. University professors, he claimed, should be paid and hired for their teaching, not their research. Um, <laughs> I think that would have worked for him. It wouldn't work for most people, but I think for him, he was so interested in teaching and in being clear that I think his research was driven by his need for clarity and it would have worked, but I don't believe that will work for most people. Um, it's sad he didn't get the Nobel Prize, but I don't think he would have cared. What's true is that the problems of finance arise in the business world and having people with academic inclinations in the center of the business world is the best place to notice and to solve their problems. And when I ran the QS group that I inherited from him from 1990 to 2000, I was very careful to always try to do the same and keep one leg in the academic world and one leg in the practitioner world and publish our papers. I think that that kind of world doesn't exist anymore. Um, when he became terminally ill, he neither hid it nor announced it, but told the necessary people and spoke about it in, in a detached, very objective way that I kind of found scary and admirable. I never heard him complain. He had a massive operation, was full of genuine praise for the surgeon who he said was a genius. Um, after the operation, he had a temporary recovery and worked again very hard. Um, for a while, we sometimes spoke on the telephone about building models of options that included jumps in the underlying index. He was always frank if you asked about his health, um, but never volunteered any information if you didn't. Later, when I could sense that he didn't feel well, and from hearing rumors, I summoned the courage to ask how he was doing on the phone. And he simply said, things look pretty iffy right now. Hmm. When he finally stopped coming to work, he still communicated with anyone who wrote to him via email. I used to like to keep in contact and would send him comments or short bits of news from work. If my emails were insubstantial, consisting of small talk or complaints about the environment, then true to his style, he seldom replied. <laughs> 
But if you wrote about some genuine issue, you received the prompt answer. I once asked him if these email questions were bothering him and he seemed to reply to say no and added a postscript saying he liked to receive these questions. At his memorial service in Cambridge, Jack Trainer gave a very, his mentor in some ways, gave a very moving speech and said that as regards death, quote, Fisher wasn't afraid at all. And that's the way it seemed to me too. He really seemed to delude himself about the way the world really worked. Um, when I think of him, I'll take a few more minutes. When I think of him, I think of him really as a very unsentimental realist unafraid to see the world and take the world for what it is. Once when I was about to travel to Vienna at a conference at which Bob Merton would be present, I called Fisher and asked how, this is already late in his life, I asked him by voicemail how I should refer to the model. Shall I call her Black Shoals or Black Shoals Merton? And Fisher replied saying it was okay to call her Black Shoals Merton because it was, this is quoting, it was Merton who had come up with the replication argument for valuing the option. And he added, that's the part many people think is the most important. That's Fisher's quote. Hmm. Um, yeah, he was kind of difficult to deal with because he was so free of artifice, I think. He didn't soft pedal in giving you your opinion of his, his opinion of your work. He had a strong sense of what was important. In the midst of corporate politics, he always told you to concentrate on quality even if the people around you sometimes didn't appreciate it and to keep your eye on the goal. He didn't sympathize with holding on to turf. Instead, he always encouraged searching for new opportunities. Hmm. I'm trying to think, I still have a few things to say. Ah, Fisher's last paper, he actually, what was called interest rate and options written while he was dying. He, he, uh, he, he, um, in a footnote to the article, the managing editor of the Financial Analyst Journal explained the circumstances behind the paper. And he wrote, I'll be very quick, he wrote, Fisher Black submitted this on May 1st. His submission letter stated, I would like to publish this, though I may not be around to make any changes the referee may, may suggest. If I'm not, and it seems roughly acceptable, could you publish it as it is with a note explaining the circumstances, which is what they did. Hmm. Um, Black Scholes and Merton really opened up the world of the. I'm running out of time. Black Scholes and Merton, I think, really opened up the world of derivative structuring. Without replication and the confidence it gave people, it would have been impossible to create all the products that drive the that drive the financial world today. In some ways, it may have gone too far. The world needs some friction, and it's not good when things run too smoothly. Before the creation of credit derivatives, you had to understand how to hedge a corporate bond with treasuries if you wanted to trade credit. Before the creation of the VIX and trading volatility required a lot of understanding about how to hedge options um, with the use of a model. Once they created options on the VIX or credit derivatives, trading volatility or trading credit became a breeze or maybe sometimes an ill wind. It's too easy for everybody to do the same thing as happened with the 1987 portfolio insurance crash. So um, sometimes I think there's some virtue to keeping things complicated. Um, ah, I'll finish off. I had something I'll say. One of the great qualities I admire is to be able to look at it. I said about Fisher, my last paragraph, to be able to look at everything in the world as itself, to not belong to any party, to not belong to any group, and then decide what to do about it. One notices this particularly now, when people on the left have to adopt the left agenda, no matter what it involves, and similarly, people on the right have to adopt the right agenda, no matter what that involves. I recently read a sentence by an English writer, Lionel Shriver, that said, in politics, one should dine only a la carte. <laughs> Fisher did this with everything, and I admire it. I'm going to stop over there. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Emmanuel. Uh, actually, I'm going to start with one, one question. Uh, I think you mentioned that the old world of sort of academic practitioner kind of research being published or being publicized is no longer around. And it's it's kind of true. We don't see those groundbreaking works that came out of Goldman and other sort of Wall Street firms. What's behind it? Is it just the low-hanging fruits have been picked or something else is behind it? I think partly it was the name of the bill um, 
whose name I now forget after the financial crisis that required people, CEOs, to sign off on the models being used. Um, I forget the name of the bill now. Um, Sarbane Oxley. Say it again. Sarbane Oxley. Sarbane Oxley. Yeah. I think, um, well, that was earlier. Um, but anyway, I think that had some effect. Um, I don't really know. Um, people are knee-jerk, secretive. They don't publish research. You don't see... You don't know what's being done behind there. Um, it's a lost world. I, I don't know. Partly, I think it's Sarbanes Oxley. Partly, there was always, there was always, I, I had to struggle quite hard in quantitative strategies to get people to let us publish at the beginning. And um, eventually they realized there was some benefit to it. Um, but it was, a, it was always a struggle at the beginning. And I think that world doesn't exist anymore. Um, I think it's sad because sitting on that middle line, um, is where the most interesting things happen. All right. Uh, any questions from the audience? We have a small audience here. Yes, Bing. I just see this car doesn't work. Yeah, can, can, can you hear me? Not very well. Uh, probably for seeing a repeat question. Um, we have some doctor students in the audience. Um, you know, some of them are finding jobs. And what is your opinion between the choice of academics versus Wall Street? Yeah, for a new PhD student, what what is your sort of your opinion of seeking employment at uh, Wall Street or academics? Uh, any sort of something from your own experience? Is the question I'm having? A, oh wait, maybe there's a Q and A on the thing. Okay, is the question um, is it better to work on Wall Street or an academic life? Yes. Um, oh boy. <laughs> I, I don't know. You know, I liked working on Wall Street. And even when I moved to academic life afterwards, um, I still worked one day a week for a hedge fund or a fund of funds. I kind of liked it. In academic life, unless you're very lucky, everybody's very siloed and interested in in their own um, in their own research and their own students. And I found it I found it more <laughs> this is probably probably um um Maybe it's not everybody's experience, but I found it more collegial working on Wall Street than I did working in a college. Uh, Maybe because if you work in a firm and you want to talk to somebody, you can walk over to them and they sort of have to listen to you and talk to you because you're all motivated by the same thing, which is helping the firm. Whereas um, working in a department, it's often a lot of individual people pulling in their own direction. But that's my individual experience. I'm sure other people have different experiences. All right. Well, thank you so much, Emmanuel. It, it was a perfect opening for this conference, your reflection on Fisher Black. And uh, again, thank you so much. You can stick around, uh, but uh, we're going to pass on, uh, okay. on to Bob Jarrah. Thank you very much. Thank you.